This segment is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security, the source for all your penetration testing and active defense needs. Visit them on the web at blackhillsinfosec.com. Founder and CEO John Strand is here with us. Say hi, John. Hello, everybody. And also with us is Ty Miller, making his second appearance here on Security Weekly. Ty, welcome back. Hey, guys. Thank you very much. And Ty, yeah. you ha- <coughs> you've prepared a um, technical segment based on your Black Hat training course, the Shell Code Lab. That's right. So I'm going to step through some uh, one of the labs that are in the Shell Code Lab, um, just demonstrate some some basic shell code that some of the the students t- uh, learn. So I mean, one of the things that we um, or all of the things that we sort of use in the shellcode lab goes from teaching guys who have never even touched assembly before. Um, one of the first questions I ask in the shellcode lab is how many have have even done assembly, and ninety five percent of them have never even done, looked at it before. And uh, when you when you look at sort of what they're doing at the end of it, it's pretty inspirational to see that you know like pretty much everyone is um, creating their own custom port bind shellcode for Mac OS X sixty four and uh, mm-hmm. Windows shellcode, and sort of you know integrating that into Metasploit payload modules and compromising machines and all those sort of things. So it's it's pretty awesome. It sounds like good times. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of fun. So, Ty, uh, it's your show now, so take it away. And okay. So, um, Amaze and astound us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. So um, this lab is lab four. So by this point in the, uh, in the training, we've sort of already gone through some of the shellcode concepts. Uh, and taught them basic assembly and uh, things like uh, shell coding techniques, like um, you know minimizing the size of your shell code and removing nulls from your shell code so that you don't break buffers and all those sort of things. Uh, so this one's basically a command execution shell code where you base where you're. Uh, creating shell code for, say, a local exploit um, for privilege escalation and you want to jump from, say, a normal user shell to a a root shell. Uh, So first thing, you basically get given, um, there's like 16 labs uh, that we go through in the shell code lab. And Mm -hmm. the first thing uh, that we really do is sort of go through how... Uh, how assembly is structured and the files are structured. So you can see up here that the uh, we've got section.txt and that's basically saying that we're going to be writing code. We're not going to be defining variables or anything like that because when you think about shellcode, you're basically injecting your shellcode in the middle of a running process. So you've got to be writing your assembly for the code section. Um, we then specify the, the architecture that you're writing it for. So for the shellcode lab, we since you're dealing with people who have never done assembly before, we sort of teach them assembly and then we start with Linux 32-bit assembly so that it's, um, you know, a little bit simpler. And then we ramp up to, you know, 64-bit OS X and Windows and then start integrating it into exploit. So um, this one's one of the earlier ones. Um, I didn't want to sort of start... Uh, Demoing how to write an egg hunter shell code is they're pretty confusing in the way that you have to structure it because they're designed to be really small. Um, so one of the things I say when I'm promoting the shell code lab is that uh, it's been designed to really hold your hand. So because you're teaching people assembly who have never done assembly and by the end of it you want them to be masters in it, um, I really held the hand in the in in being able to help them progress rather than get stuck on stuff that you would typically just Google for. So I provide them things like, uh, so for the for this particular example, we're spawning a shell. So we're going to be doing, calling two functions. We're going to be setting uh, the real and effective user ID using the syscall set RUID. And then we're going to be spawning a new shell um, using the syscall execv. So you can see along the top here, we've got the uh, the registers um, that we need to set up, and then we've got the values or the parameters and things that we're actually going to put into our registers. Um, so the syscall number for set RUID is 203. 
Uh, we've then got, so in hex, uh, that's CB, and that goes into EAX. We then have the real user ID, um, which is going to go into EBX. So in this case, we're going to be, or in most cases, for short coding, you want to get root access, right? So uh, we're going to be putting that to zero to be root, and the effective user ID, um, we're going to be setting ECX to zero so that it's root again. So if we jump straight into it, um, uh, the way that you, uh, the first thing you need to do in shell coding is to zero out a register. Um, so you typically can't assume that your registers are going to be zero because, like I said before, as you're injecting our code into the middle of a running process, your registers could be anything, right? So first thing we want to do is clear out um, EAX because we're going to use that first. And that's done by XORing something, XORing the register with itself. So if you XOR something with itself, the end result is zero. And that's an efficient way of actually clearing out a register. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do is move um, into EAX, OXCB. And that is, if we have a look up here, that's the syscall number. So when, you, when you're when you shellcoding for uh, Unix-based systems, you're using uh, syscalls and um, they have specific numbers assigned to them. And, uh, you know, I provide all of those up here in this syscalls.txt file if the students want to go and have a look at it. Um, and then the next thing we want to do is set the real and effective user ID, which up here again we can see going to EBX and ECX. Uh, so we're going to oops, we're going to XOR EBX with itself to zero it out. And same thing with ECX. And then to call, tell the kernel to call the function, um, you do int 80. So the kernel is then going to go to that function, pull all the corresponding registers out or the values out, and then execute the function for you. So at that point, uh, we've basically run the set reuid function um, to get root access or maintain root access, um, depending upon what you're actually doing. So the next thing we're going to be doing is uh, doing the exec v function, and that's to spawn a new process. Uh, so again, the students are provided with all of the information that they need to a point. Um, so the syscall number for exec v is 11, which comes to a b, which goes into eax. So the syscall number always goes into eax. And this is all sort of learned uh, earlier in the course. Um, then we have EBX, uh, which we can see as a pointer to a string, and that's um, going to be a pointer to our command that we're going to be running. Um, ECX and EDX, you can see, are pointers to pointers, uh, and they're basically the um, pointers to the arguments that we're passing to the function or to the command and the environment variables that we're passing to the command. Um, so in this case, we just want to spawn a shell. We don't, we don't want to pass any environment variables or, um, you know, any arguments. So we can actually set those, point those to nulls. Um, so what you see here, which has already been filled out, is a thing called uh, jump call pop technique, which is used to... Uh, locate a hard-coded string. Um, so because we're running somewhere in memory that we don't actually know where we are, um, we, we can't just sort of start defining parameters and things like that because we don't know where they're defined and all those sort of things. We're in the middle of a running process. So so we've down the bottom here we've defi defined bin dash is the command that we're going to be executing. Um, and this is how you hard code a string in shell code. So you use the db instruction. So we've got bin dash, and then we've got, you need to null terminate um, the string so that you know the exec v function knows where the, where the actual string finishes. So the n is a null placeholder. And then before we, we mentioned that we need to have a pointer to the arguments and pointer to the environment variable. So the A's here are going to be nulled out 
because we don't want any um, any arguments being passed to it. Um, but we still need to point ECX to a null. Um, same with the Bs here, we need to point EDX to a set of nulls. So, so what that's doing basically by the time we get to this point, um, we've defined the string, we've located it, and we've popped the address of that string off the stack. So, so Ty, so, this, this yep. shellcode's running on the stack in this case? Uh, it's, no, no, so it can be running anywhere. So this, it really depends on what your exploit is doing, right? But typically yeah. this is going to be your exploit would have uh, allocated, say, an executable um, chunk of memory and then copied this into the memory and then executed it. I see. So you get around stack execution prevention, which comes even in 32-bit Linux kernels, right? Uh, yeah. And, I mean, it again, it, it sort of depends. Really, it's up to the exploit to get to that point Mm -hmm. I guess where you know they could be using rob chains and all those sort of things to to find somewhere to execute stuff. Right, right. Um, right. Or it could just be you could grab this shell code and actually convert it into a, into a rob chain itself. Um, so yeah. really, it depends on you know the type of system that you're exploiting, um, as well as the exploit that you're using and and things like that. Um, but in this case, uh, when we actually compile this. Um, I'll show you the shellcode compiler uh, where it actually execute, uh, it compiles, it extracts the shellcode and then creates a exe for you so that you can just run an executable to kick off your shellcode so you don't actually have to mess around with trying to exploit something, um, you know, to actually just test out your shellcode. Um, so, uh, yeah, so again, the first thing we want to do is uh, XOR EAX because we don't know at this point um, what the value of EAX is. So even though we've XORed it up the top here, um, at this point, because we haven't actually run the shellcode yet, we don't know if set REUID has actually returned something into EAX, so we don't know if it's null, so we can't make that assumption at this point. So what I say to my students is that you basically want to write your shellcode to be functional to begin with um, and comment everything, and then after that you, um, you, you want to then go back and then start, um, you know, sort of condensing it down and optimizing it and removing